this summer we were treated to some pretty awesome pics of the universe from the James Webb Telescope. And some of you maybe have seen those, and if you haven't, it's worth looking up um, on the internet or elsewhere in maybe some magazines. But just beautiful pictures, pictures, parts of the universe we've never been able to see before. And some, when they looked at those pictures and all the different galaxies that we can now see, some of them, uh, some people looked at that and said, see, that just proves that we're living in this dark void, that uh, there's no way there's a God because there's just way too much out there. There's just too much void. For some people they, who believed in the Big Bang Theory, they said, well, what we're seeing really disproves the Big Bang Theory. I tend to agree. Uh, but when, the more we look at this, but there, we need to find another theory of how all this came about that doesn't involve the Big Bang. For some, when they looked at all those pictures, they said, with the psalmist, the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. God put a desire to know him in all of us. And um, you experienced, hopefully, gratitude this week. And uh, you had an outlet for that gratitude. You could thank God for the things that you have. It's interesting. I've heard enough um, atheists talk. And uh, one of the real frustrations with being an atheist, Daniel Dennett actually said this, is that I don't have anyone to thank. Daniel Dennett had a heart attack years ago and found himself alive in a hospital bed and said the most frustrating thing is that I didn't have anyone to thank for the, for the fact that I'm alive. He said, I look around, I see beauty, and I, I don't know who to thank. And so he just thanks goodness. Thank goodness. Well, goodness didn't bring all this about. God did. And there is something in us that even when we're thankful, proves that there is something within us that knows there's a God and is thankful, naturally thankful to God for what we have. When we're in trouble, it's a natural thing. It's a God-given thing for us to reach out to a higher power, to a supernatural being, uh, the one that we know as God. It's natural for us to do that. That's not an evolutionary tick. It's put there by God. Now, as Christians, we know God. We, um, we know God on a personal level. It's not just an ethereal, we thank goodness, or we're thankful to Mother Nature, or whatever. We know the God of the universe. And um, it, we need to remember that it's a privilege to know him in that intimate way. The writer of Hebrews is talking to some people who are wondering what is the best way to connect with God. Most of these people, as Hebrews, the name uh, gives it away, as Hebrews were people that were Jewish Christians, maybe that had been converted to the faith of Christ. And they were still thinking about that old Judaism, and some of them were wondering if maybe that was the way to go. Maybe, maybe we were being tricked. And I think everybody thinks that at some point. How do I know that I'm right? How do I know that what I found in Jesus Christ is the right way to think about it? What if, what if it's another way? And whenever people ask me questions like that, well, how do you know that Buddhism isn't the right way, or Hinduism isn't the right way? How do you know that the Muslims are wrong? How do you know that the Catholics are right? How do you know that there's another belief system that isn't the right one, and maybe you're wrong? And if it's a good faith question, I will ask, well, how would you know the difference? How would you know who was right or who was wrong? And for most people who say, well, what about this and what about this and what about this? They've never actually studied those religions. It's more just kind of a question to throw people off. Uh, I'm confident in what I believe. Um, and I've thought through it and I've experienced it. And it's what I'm hanging my hopes on. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along today. But they're wondering if maybe they made the wrong choice. And maybe Judaism was the right choice. And maybe they should go back to Judaism. And the theme of Hebrews is that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than the Levitical priesthood. He's better than the sacrifices. He's better than the altar. He's better than the tabernacle. He's better than the temple. Jesus has provided a better sacrifice with better blood, with a better covenant, with better commandments. And we've made we've been making that point the whole book. So we're wrapping things up now. And he wants to urge them to keep running that race, as he talked about at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12. Keep running that race and go ahead to better. So we want to talk this morning about a connection with God. And as we finish this uh, chapter, just to talk about what does God do and how do we respond to that. So he says this in verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, 
which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded, as if so much a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. All right, now, um, if uh, you read that in a devotional book, for your morning devotions, you maybe wouldn't get a whole lot out of that, right? Like, what's going on here? Well, what's going on is what do you read this morning out of Exodus chapter 19, which is where I invite you to go. We'll come back to Hebrews 12 in a moment, but I want you to go to Exodus chapter 19, where we just were. So back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, Moses is up in the wilderness, and he sees this bush that's burning, but it's not burning. And he goes forward, and God speaks to him out of this burning bush. He had this burning bush to get his attention. He draws near, and God speaks to Moses and said, Moses, I'm going to send you back to uh, Egypt, and you're going to bring my people. And he doesn't just say out of Egypt, but he says, I want you to bring them back to Mount Horeb so that they can worship me. So he says, so where all this took place, the burning bush took place on Mount Sinai. And he says to Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and bring them to this point, and I will speak to them. I'm speaking to you now, but bring them back to this mountain, and I will speak to all of Israel and give them my commandments, and I'll make a covenant with them there. So after he left Egypt, Moses brought them to Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb, to meet with God. And in verse number 16 of chapter 19 here, we see it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and a, the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. God appears in darkness. Again, just imagine this mountain. And yeah, you might have some storms every once in a while, but looking up at this mountain, and I've, I've never been there. I've, I don't know exactly. They're not even exactly, exactly sure where Mount Sinai was. But imagine looking up at this mountain and there's a roiling smoke, a roiling dark cloud, darker than you've ever seen before, and lightning and thunder and this trumpet emanating from that. And all the people standing around this mountain look at that and they get scared, naturally, right? What's going to happen? If you see something like that and you think it's rain, you naturally think, when's all that rain going to come my way? Are we all going to die with lightning? Verse number 18, Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Again, it was this terrifying scene where God, there's fire in there. It's this, this, this engulfing fire. There's smoke going up and around. There's lightning. There's an earthquake. It's God is descending to earth in power and in terror. And their reaction was, in chapter 20, go over to chapter 20, verse 18. The people saw, the so chapter 20, verses 1 through 17 are the Ten Commandments. If you're looking for where the Ten Commandments are, it's in chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, 17. And then verse 18 says, All the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you. And that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. It was the intention of God to speak to the, all of Israel, but when they saw God in physical presence on the mountain, they said, you know what? <laughs> this is too much. It's too much. I, I'm terrified of God. Why don't Moses, you go talk to him, and then come back and tell us what he said. We can't bear to hear from God directly. So why don't you go into the mount, you talk with God, and you come back, and you can be kind of the kind of a mediator for us. You can tell us what he said, and we will obey. But again, they saw God. And over in chapter 24, it says in verse 16, The glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. 
And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mountain. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Again, so they said, Moses, you go in with the glory of the Lord. He can't, people can't stand to see the full glory of the Lord. God says, no one can see my face. If they do, they'll, they'll die. And so he appeared in this smoke, but he appeared in this this glorious appearance, this he, this terrifying figure on the mount, shrouded in smoke. And so the people saw it, and they, they knew he existed, right? There's no question at all, there is a God. And he's on that mount, and he's come down to earth. He is not aloof, he is part of our experience. And they were so terrified and afraid by that, that they said, Moses, you go up into the mount. You say, well... Why did God appear like that? You know, why, why would he do that? Why would he scare them half to death? You know, there's got to be a better way to do that. They would have believed if he appeared in some other way. Well, let's test that theory. Yeah, yeah. So here's God appeared to Adam and Eve. He, he walked with them in the cool of the day as a gentle friend. What did Adam and Eve do? They rebelled against him. Oh, maybe God's trying to withhold something from them. And they, they ate the fruit. God appeared to Abraham. Abraham, I am your shield and exceeding great reward. And what did Abraham do? He tried to circumvent God's will with Hagar, giving birth to Ishmael. God appeared to, uh, to Jacob. He, he said, I will be your God. And what did Jacob do? He still tried to scheme. He tried to cheat. He tried to lie. He tried to still get his way. And again, these are all gentle ways that God appeared to people. God appeared to Moses in the bush. I've heard the cry of my people, and, and I want to send you to bring them back. And what does Moses do? Send somebody else. I mean, God comes to him gently, and he says, no, no that's not really my thing. You're going to have to find somebody else to go. And so God then appeared on the mountain. The people are too afraid of that. So then uh, Moses comes up into the mount. Moses, who, by the grace of God, is able to talk with God, uh, not face to face, again, because otherwise he would die, but he was able to take what from God the Ten Commandments, right? So he comes back, um, uh, or, or he comes back down to the mount, and what did they do? He's been up there 40 days, I mean, he's probably dead, that smoke probably got him. Let's go ahead and go back to Egypt, let's make a golden calf and say, these are your gods. Take your back. Now again, over and over again, I can give you examples of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, I don't believe in God. God sends ten plagues. And at the end, Pharaoh says, fine, I believe in your God. But then, when God parts the Red Sea, what does Moses do? He tries to go through the Red Sea too to follow them. Like you can say, oh, why doesn't God show himself in other ways? But have you noticed the pattern that no matter how God shows himself, no matter how gentle or harsh, however God shows himself and says, this is who I am and this is what I want from you, there's something in us that says, no thanks. So I, I've talked to atheists who have said, oh, if God showed himself in some real way, then I would believe. And I think to myself, like what real way? Yeah. Like in a, in a bush that's burning but not burning? You would say no. Walking with you and talking with you in the garden, you would still rebel. Like, like, a, like smoke on a mountain with lightning and, and the sound of a trumpet? You'd still make a golden calf after 40 days. And go back. That's right. God appeared to Solomon twice, the Bible yeah. says. And what happened at the end of Solomon's life? He turned against God, started serving all these idols. And again, it's so sad because God says, I appeared to him twice. Like, what more do you want? It almost seems like it doesn't matter what God does, we are going to do what we're going to do. We're going to rebel against God. So if anybody is saying, look, I, I, would, I just wish God would do a little bit more. What more can he say than to you he has said? Yeah. Is there anything else that you want from God? I bet, I, I'll just bet that God would give it to you if he actually thought it would do any good at all. And here's what, here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. These people back in Israel, they saw God on the mountain. Is that what you want to go back to? You want to go back to the terror of God? Don't think that that's better than what you have. Now, what you have, we're going to look at in a little bit here. But God has shown himself to many, many, shown himself to us in many, many different ways. 
Um, and I can give you some arguments for the existence of God. Now, it's interesting. The Bible never gives an, an argument for his existence. The beginning of the Bible says, in the beginning, God. Just an assumption. An a priori uh, knowledge of God. God exists. He is. And he needs no explanation. I don't believe in God. Then you are a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But just in case you need some help believing that there is a God, or at least establishing your faith in some way or not, let me give you just three arguments for the existence of God. The first is called the uh, cosmological argument for God. And it goes like this. Premise number one, the universe began to exist. Two, what begins to exist has a cause. Right? Anything that be, at, one, at, one, at one point wasn't, and yet now is, has a cause, a cause that's outside of itself. This cause must be, premise three, eternal, transcendent, powerful, and personal. So the universe began to exist. That means it has a cause. That cause has to, by definition of what the universe is, has to be eternal, transcendent, powerful, and personal. Therefore, God exists because the universe began to exist. If you see anything around, why is there something rather than nothing? The answer is God. Let me give you the fine-tuning argument. Premise number one, the universe appears to be fine-tuned for life. We can talk about the tilt of the earth. We can talk about where the earth is in our kind of galaxy. We can talk about the distance that the earth is away from the sun. Or we can talk about where the moon is and uh, how it's perfectly placed. We can talk about the perfect uh, atmospheric pressure or the perfect amount of nitrogen and oxygen in our atmosphere and, and, and uh, the existence of water. They're looking for one tiny little bit of water on Mars. And our Earth is covered, three quarters of, the, of our Earth is covered with water. There's no other planet that we know of that has liquid water like we, like we have it here. And they take these telescopes and they look and they're like, oh, there's a possibility that that one has water on it about a billion years ago. You don't know. Okay, just say you don't know. But anyway, <laughs> all those things prove that, uh, that what we know about life on planet Earth, it appears to be fine-tuned for life. Not right. only all those things, but all those things in relation to one another. If one little thing was a little off, there would be no life on Earth. That's right. Premise two, fine-tuning is due to either necessity chance, or by design by an intelligent mind. Fine-tuning, premise three, is not due to necessity. It doesn't need to be that way. And it isn't by chance, because the chances are so infinitesimal. The chances of, of the earth being as fine-tuned for life as it is, by chance, is so small we have a word for it. Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, the earth must be fine-tuned by the intelligent design of an intelligent mind. That is God. Amen. Number three, God shows himself in our awareness of moral objectives. Premise number one, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist, meaning something is really wrong. Not societally, society says this, uh, culturally it says this, but objective moral values are and if God doesn't exist, objective moral values don't exist. Premise two, objective moral values do exist, therefore God exists. Now again, the Bible doesn't come up with those. Those are just people that have been thinking about this for years. An honest person could come to the point where they say, I believe that there is a God. But you know God, not through those ways, but through other ways. Through little ways, through his protection, through his provision. Maybe this week you thought about all the ways that, the ways that God has protected you and provided for you. Uh, and though your life isn't perfect, and though you wish maybe things were a little bit different, you had enough to say, God has been good to me. God has watched out for me. I know God in that way. And I'm talking to people, I believe, this morning that don't need the, the, they don't need the cosmological argument. They don't need the ontological argument. They don't need the fine-tuning or the... Uh, existence of miracles, they don't need all those arguments. You already believe in God. However, can I just caution you that it's not enough to believe that there is a God. James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Mm -hmm. Satan believes in God, but he doesn't believe in, the God in, believe in God in the right way. He believes God exists. Again, you'd be a fool to not believe God exists, but the question is, how are you related to God? 
And the people here in Exodus chapter 19, they saw the mountain and they saw the smoke and they believed in God. They were terrified of him. But not so terrified that they wouldn't make a golden calf 40 days later yeah. and say, these are the gods, follow them back. Not so terrified that when God didn't, you know, when God provided food for them every single day, they didn't at some point complain and be like, hey, it'd be nice to have something else. I mean, this, this miracle bread is nice, but I mean... I mean, we have something else, and why? If, if, understand that there's always an attack from Satan on what you believe. And so uh, these Hebrew Christians wanted to go back to God, but the one that they wanted to go back to was largely an unapproachable God. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12 then. Because he, he says in verse number 18, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, dot, 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 down in verse 22, but ye are come unto the Mount Zion. Okay, so he's making a contrast. The, the, the God you believe in is the God of the mountain, but that's not the way you know him. You don't know God as the smoky mountain, uh, thundering, sound of the trumpet. That's not the God that you've come to know. That's the same God, but God hasn't presented himself in that way to you. You instead are come unto Mount Zion. And unto the city of the living God, verse 22, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Again, so eloquent. The writer of Hebrews obviously was a... Um, someone who is versed in rhetoric, which is why I think it was someone like Apollos, if not Apollos himself, who wrote this. But he says, you haven't, you're not going to the Mount Sinai that's on a smoke. You're coming to Mount Zion, the spiritual mountain of God. This is heaven. If you read Revelation 21, what, what's descending out of heaven? When we talk about the streets of gold, what are we literally talking about? Not just heaven, but the new Jerusalem. That's what has the streets of gold. That's what has all the foundations with all these beautiful jewels on it. This is heaven. God's not calling us back to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, and the law. He's calling us to something better. So who is there? Who, who is the, the, the people of this heavenly kingdom? The Mount Zion, the, the heavenly Jerusalem. What, who is at that place? Well, he mentions, first of all, an innumerable company of angels. There's glory, there's power, there's majesty. God's, all of his resources, I think it talks about all of God's resources available for us in his heavenly host. He also says that in verse 23, the church is there. Those believers in heaven who have endured, I have friends, I have family that are in heaven waiting for me. Uh, they're not at Mount Sinai. They're not, they're not there in heaven because of the law. They're in heaven because of Jesus Christ. And I'm looking forward to seeing them again. I, can, I know that, I can, that I'm going to heaven not because I'm a good person, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm getting there the same way that they got there through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, through belief in him. They have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They are the spirits of just men made perfect. Not only that, but uh, third, who's there? God, in verse 23. God, the judge of all. The, the one who has declared us righteous. Uh, the truth is that at Mount Sinai, when I went there, I found the law. And the law said, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. And I found that I wasn't doing those things. And it said, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And I found that I was doing those things. And I said, well, what hope is there? And Mount Sinai said, oh. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you that what you should do. If you're doing the wrong thing, that's, that's not on Mount Sinai. They're just there to tell you what's right and what's wrong. And we find that all of us have sinned. The Bible even says in James 1 and 22, if any of you keep the whole law, the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. I found myself guilty in Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, couldn't help, why would I go back to that? But I did find the help that I needed on Mount Calvary. Amen. I, I didn't find the help that I needed on Mount Zion, in Jerusalem. I found in, in the, the Spirit of Christ, moving, um, uh, I, I found in Jesus Christ, who went who lived in Mount Zion, 
who went to be crucified in Mount Calvary, I found what I was looking for then. The, again, I want to be one of those spirits of just men made perfect. And when it says that the God, uh, God the judge of all is there, it means that I was guilty, that the law de declared me guilty. But through Jesus Christ, I have now been declared righteous Amen. and innocent. That, that on the cross, Jesus took all of my sins, and he was declared guilty for me. And he, through his righteousness, gave that to me so that I could be declared innocent. God's the judge of all, and he's a righteous judge. He can't just say, well, I love Josh too much to throw him in hell forever, and so I'll just let this one go. He's a good God. He can't just say that. There had to be a way for me and my sins to be paid for, and that was through Jesus Christ, which is why it says in verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of angel, so uh, that are able, rather. So let me just break that down a little bit. Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. Moses, back in verse number 21, quaked before when he went to see God. When he went up into the mountain, I mean, he went up, but it, this was a different form of God than when he saw him at the burning bush. This was, again, what a terrifying thing to walk up into that mountain where there's smoke and lightning and the sound of a trumpet. And Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. He was a mediator who was terrified. But Jesus Christ went even farther than the terrifying aspect of Mount Sinai. He went to the terrifying aspect of becoming sin for me, of being rejected by the Father. Now, for most people, it doesn't seem very terrifying to be rejected by God because we're born sinners. People love that they don't have a relationship with God. Obviously, if they wanted a relationship with God, they'd respond, right? If there was anything in people that want, I mean, our church would be full if people understood what, that they're, they, they're not right with God and that someday they're going to stand before him. If they really understood that, then they would be here. They would want to hear the gospel. I would, have, I would be, do nothing but sit in my office and counsel people on the phone or in person about how they can have their sins forgiven, but that's not happening. Because people don't care that they're separated from God. Jesus did, and he went to the cross so that he might be separated from the Father for me. Moses quaked when he went from the presence of God. And Jesus, though he cried in the garden, said, Not my will, but thine be done. And he went into the mount for me and for you. It's a better covenant. He gave... Um, so that, and Not just that he went, but that he gave us a better covenant. So the covenant of the law is, if you do these things, you're righteous. You can't do those things, therefore you're unrighteous. The better covenant is, I will keep the law for you, and I will give you not just my righteousness, but a new heart. Not a stone heart, but a fleshy heart. I'll take out your heart of stone, I'll put in a fleshy heart, that's called being born again. Being born again is not just a better version of you, it is a new you. The old you died, and in its place is a new creature. Praise God. That's, that's the way it has to be. It has to be that way. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep doing what I do. But when Christ saved me, he made me someone new. It's the, he's the mediator of a better covenant. And then he says, And to the blood of sprinkling that, that speaketh better things than that of angel. Uh, Abel. Why did I keep saying angel? Abel. Um, I don't know exactly what that means, but probably the best understanding is this, that Jesus sprinkled better blood. Now, why does he mention Abel? Abel. I'm saying Abel. Why did he mention Abel? Well, what do we know about Abel and his blood? Well, uh, when God approaches Cain about the murder in Abel's blood, Abel's blood was crying out for vengeance, right? I die. You have to avenge me. Do something about my death. What does the blood of Jesus Christ do for us? He shed his blood. And he's not calling out for the blood of those who killed him which was me and my sin. He's calling out that, his blood is calling out that I might be forgiven. He speaketh better things than the blood of angel, uh, Abel. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking better things. God's intent was not for us to know him through prophets and through lightning and through signs in the sky. You come to church looking for an experience with God. You know, I would believe in God if all of a sudden there would be this thing that happened that everyone could know. That's not the way God speaks to us. God speaks to us through Jesus Christ. God speaks to us through his word. God speaks to us through um, 
uh, through his spirit. God sent Jesus Christ to live to this earth to live our life, to show us what dependence looks like. Jesus came to live not only a life as an example, but he came to live and die and live again so that he could live in us. Now, the Christian life is not one of me, Jesus, saying, Here, here's another list of things. Yeah, yeah, Mount Sinai, that's good. Keep that one, but also keep this one. No, he, Jesus came to live his life through me. And if I surrender to him and if I said, God, I, am, I want you to live your life through me, then that's what Jesus came to do. The Holy Spirit gives us life. He gives us personal experience with him in guidance, in comfort, in help in teaching, in encouragement, and sometimes in rebuke. I have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. That's better than a mountain that's on fire. That's better than a bush that's burning. That's better than God spelling something out in the night sky. I love looking at the night sky, but I'm not looking there for specific connections with God. I have a connection with God and something better through Jesus Christ. It's better than the Old Covenant. Uh, go with me to 2 Corinthians. We'll come back to Hebrews 12 in just a moment to finish things up. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, excuse me, 3, 2 Corinthians 3. Second Corinthians 3, verse 6 says, Who also hath made us able ministers? So it's talking about God. God also made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. We're in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? And again, what he's saying is this. When God gave... Moses, the law, Moses brought it down, written and engraven on stones, and the stones remained. Remember, they were in the Ark of the Covenant, although we don't know where they are today, but they remained. But remember, Moses' face shone when he went to talk with God. His, his skin glowed, but not forever. It, that glow went away after a while. But he said, but that was so glorious. The giving of the law was so glorious that Moses' face shone. But what we have is something better. Shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Meaning this, again, the Old Testament condemned. How much, and that was glorious. That showed God's glory, the condemnation through the law. How much more glorious when we know Jesus Christ? Verse 10, for even that which was made glorious hath no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is to be abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Listen, what we have in the Holy Spirit of God is better than that evidence of God on the mountain. What happened on the mountain? Do you remember? Moses came back down, they had a golden calf, and uh, God told the Levites to go through and, and slay those that were disobeying God. How many people died on that day? Do you remember? 3,000. Okay, fast forward to Acts chapter 2. The whole, now, the law was given, 3,000 people died. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is given. The Holy Spirit comes, and people start speaking in tongues. Peter preaches. How many people got saved? 3,000 people got saved. Because the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. See, what we have is better than, our experience with God and the Holy Spirit is better than what they have. It's better than, I'm not saying don't read the Old Testament, read it, but listen, read it and say, but we have something better. Amen. 
I want to know God like David knows God. You know, you can. David didn't have the Holy Spirit. David didn't have the Bible. David didn't have a new, a new nature given to him through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He didn't have any of those things. You want a relationship like those people in the Old Testament? You can have it. Because God's given you something better. There are better things than the mountain. There are better things than the Old Covenant. There's better blood shed for you. You can have that relationship. You want a connection with God? You, of all people, can have that. So, let's make some application then. Back in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. So based on all these things, you want to go back to the law, don't do it. See then, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now hath he promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. I'll just say, first of all, What's the application as we live in God's kingdom? In this new era of a relationship with God that's different from everybody else in the Bible that's ever existed. One, listen to what God says and learn to cultivate a relationship with him. Listen, what we were saying here is when God spoke, he expected them to listen. The same is true for us. Just because our sins have been forgiven, just because we know God in a different way, doesn't mean it's less important that God speaks to us. There may be, there may be less consequences. But for you as a Christian to think, oh, it doesn't matter because I'm a saved person, is not the Christian way. That's not the kingdom of God. That is, that is from Satan and you have believed a lie. When God, so when God spoke, he expected them to listen. Do you live like God has any say in your life? Are you submitted to him? Are there areas in your life that you are not submitted to him? Listen, if people on the mountain were terrified, how much more terrified should we be to do the things that are right, knowing God in a more intimate way that, that we should? Do you know what it's like to converse with him and seek his will and seek his face? Have you, have, are you listening to what he says? That's the first application. The second one is to focus on the permanent, not the temporary. In verse 26, he says, his, whose voice then shook the earth. Again, when God spoke on the mountain, the whole earth shook. But he says, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. You know what the book of Revelation is? It's a purging. The book of Revelation is a terrifying thing. But you know, at the end of all of that, Jesus Christ comes back and establishes a kingdom on the earth. And the things that are temporary, which is most of what we see, will all be done on the earth. And that which is seemingly weak right now, those of us who seem like we're kind of in the minority and, and people aren't really taking the Bible seriously and people aren't really taking Christian, those are the things that will remain. God's voice will speak in such a way that, that all of the temporary will be knocked away. And only that which is permanent will remain. What's permanent? Well, what's permanent is your relationship with God. What's permanent is those you can talk to about the Lord that you can bring into the kingdom. What's permanent is the promises of God. Those are the things that we ought to focus on. And yet, how much of our life is spent focusing on those things and how much of our life is focused on temporary things? You've lived long enough to know that there are things that were exciting to you 30 years ago that you don't even remember at the time. Things that were the number one thing in your life, and you know how much, how, how much things can change and how the excitement for things that were your whole world can go. You already know that on a small scale, but listen, it's still true today. There are things that on your deathbed and in glory, you will say, why do you spend so much time on the temporary? God's voice from heaven, uh, if God's voice spoke from the mountain, Sinai, and shook the earth, how much more when God's voice speaks from heaven and destroys all the temporary, and whatever you have left is what you have. That's what's permanent. So focus on that. Focus on that reward in heaven. Focus on bringing people to Christ. He quotes Haggai 2.6, where it says, God will shake the heaven one day, or uh, he'll shake, shake the heaven one day as well. We are to focus on what will remain. 
And then finally, as an admonition, serve God. Verses 28 and 29 very simply say this, Wherefore are we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, again, that's the permanent, not the temporary, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Since God is a kingdom, let's serve it. Since he did everything through Jesus Christ to bring us to that kingdom, let's serve in God's kingdom. Let's keep him uppermost in all of our affections and desires. To have grace shows that we ought to rely on his strength. It's not just to serve God, but he says, have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably. God wants to live his life. Jesus wants to live his life through you. Your job is only to take up his grace and to, and to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Who is the God that you are serving? Who is the God that you know? Right? He, he is the God of the bush that's burning. He is the still small voice that spoke to Elijah. He is the God on the mountain that thundered. He's the God that sent an angel that killed 185,000 of the Syrians in one night. He's the God of revelation that will shake the earth. He's the God that meets with you every day. Amen. He is that God and you can know him. And that's a better way than all the other people that have experienced God in other times.